Good, good evening, and uh, my name is Sean Quimby. I'm the director of Columbia University's Rare Book and Manuscript Library, a position that I've held for all of one month now. <laughs> Thank you. Long before I came to Columbia, and long before I decided to dedicate my life to special collections, I was a comics fan. Much to the... <laughs> much to the disappointment of my highbrow, opera-loving parents. For them, comic books represented a sort of developmental bridge from the image-dependent child to the fully literate adult. But by the time I was 13, my father was quite certain that there was something wrong with me. But that was precisely the point in time that I needed comic books the most. At some point in the mid-1980s, I purchased my first graphic novel, God Loves, Man Kills, by Chris Claremont and Brent Eric Anderson, which I have bought with me. The action transfixed me, the sex titillated me, and the story reassured me that I might find my way in a world that to an awkward seventh grader seemed increasingly scary. I didn't read comic books because I was too lazy or unimaginative imaginative to read a novel, I read them because they were beautiful, and probably because my parents so vigorously disapproved of them. <laughs> Tonight we're here to celebrate the opening of comics at Columbia, and we're very fortunate to have a distinguished panel of guests, including the aforementioned Chris Claremont. At the conclusion of remarks, we'll head to the sixth floor gallery. As you walk through the exhibition, you'll find comics that are beautiful and comics that I expect you, or at least your parents, would disapprove of. <laughs> now I'm going to turn things over to Karen Green, the curator of comics at Columbia and the person responsible for building our world-class collection. She is also, by the way, the ancient and medieval history and religion librarian. Many of you already know her. I am just getting to know her. Karen brings passion and intensity to her job, and I suspect to whatever it is she chooses to do in life. Karen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. You know, Sean's only been here, as he said, a little over a month, but it's remarkable how effortlessly he has fit in and how already it seems like he's been here all along. Now, first, there are people I need to thank. There's always people we need to thank, so bear with me. Thanks first to our co-sponsors, the Columbia University Science Fiction Society, or CUSFUS, and the Hyman Center for the Humanities, which incidentally is going to be holding an event in early December with Art Spiegelman, Jules Pfeiffer, and Alex Melamed that I am sure you're all going to want to go to. The number one person, though, to thank who hasn't made it here yet, he said he was going to be late, uh, the number one person to thank without whom none of us would be here tonight is Michael Ryan, the former director of the Rare Book and Manuscript Library, or RBML, who was supportive and enthusiastic when I first approached him with the idea of collecting comics creators archives and committed RBML to supporting uh, one event per semester. I'd also like to thank someone else I don't see in the audience, which is sad, uh, Columbia alumnus Michael Lustig, uh, who first had the idea. This was the whole thing, whole exhibition was his idea. Uh, he thought it would be a way to, as Nuke Lelouch said in Bull Durham, announce our presence with authority. <laughs> um, thanks especially go to my director, my own director, Barbara Rockenbach, and to all colleagues in the History and Humanity Division who have displayed the patience and understanding of saints as I have blown off responsibility after responsibility <laughs> in the last few months as I immersed myself in this exhibition. Thanks to Matt Hampel for his logistical planning, and especially to Allison Morrow 
for her, for her unbelievably thorough logistical planning. She is a, a dervish of marketing and organization. Don't any of you dare to hire her away from us. <laughs> Thanks to Vasade Ristonis and Georgia Southworth of Alexis Hagedorn's remarkable conservation lab, who mended tears, cleaned extraneous dirt, created mounts, and generally gave the 165 or so pieces in this exhibition all the TLC that they deserve. I didn't know a thing about archives when I began this initiative in 2010, so I'd like to thank RBML curators, former curator Gerald Cloud, current curator Carla Nielsen, uh, for their generous counsel. Thanks also to Carrie Hintz, our head of archives processing, who has gone out of her way to make our archives accessible to an eager public, often before any formal processing has occurred. I didn't know a thing about curating exhibitions either. Um, so thanks to Assistant University Archivist Jocelyn Wilk, who pointed me to amazing materials in Columbia's own archives, the university's own archives, including the 18th century comic strip uh, that you see featured on our exhibition poster. And thanks also to Jane Siegel, our curator of rare books, who cheerfully gave her time to help me navigate the labyrinthine stacks of the rare book library. Someone whose absence is sorely felt tonight is our university librarian, Jim Neal, who had to be at a conference and is sorry not to be here. People always ask me, what kind of pushback did you get when you first proposed the graphic novels collection? And they're surprised when I say that not only did I not get pushback, but I got unequivocal and, and enthusiastic support. Jim has been an unfailing booster, and I'm so very grateful. And finally, Jenny Lee. Jenny Lee, our Curator of Performing Arts and Exhibition Coordinator, I cannot even begin to describe the indefatigable cheerleading and selfless assistance Jenny has provided me. If it had been up to me to lay out the cases upstairs, I can tell you that everything would still be in piles on a table <laughs> while I lay curled in fetal position underneath it, <laughs> weeping softly. And of course, thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. It makes me so happy to see so many familiar and beloved faces in the audiences. There's got to be a seat for Sam Gross, right? You've got to find a seat for Sam. <laughs> So, how did all this happen? In part because of my fervent and unshaking belief that the comics medium, this unique combination of words and images that is so much greater than the sum of its parts, is worthy of academic study. Our circulating graphic novels collection, which we initiated in 2005, has gone from three titles to over 4,300 titles, and is used by a wide variety of disciplines, uh, in a wide variety of ways, including the first course dedicated to the American graphic novel. <laughs> Co-taught twice now by tenured professor Jeremy Dauber standing in the doorway. Co-teaching with Paul Levitz, who is still apparently driving down from uh, Manhattanville College and Purchase. He'll be here. He'll be here. This activity helped make possible our venture into creator archives, which has grown so remarkably in the past three or four years that when we posted our search for a new RBML director, of which we uh, got Sean, when we posted that job earlier this year, comics was listed as one of our collection strengths. <laughs> The year after we acquired the Claremont Archives, in fact, that collection became the most requested collection in the entire rare book and manuscript library. Wow. <laughs> one of the things I love so much about libraries, there's so much to love. But one of the things I love so much is that our philosophy, our core philosophy, is grounded in organization, preservation, and access. Not to trash talk museums. I love museums. And two out of three ain't bad. 
<laughs> but generally, a visitor sees no more than about 10% of a museum's collection, and the rest is stored away where very, very few people can find it. But our rare book and manuscript library is open to the global community of scholars. Anyone can create a research account, come and request something, and it will be brought to them. This keeps the legacy of our creators alive. And as an archive, we collect so much more than just original art. Although, believe me, we're not averse to original art. <coughs> uh, we collect correspondence, contracts, uh, rough sketches, drafts, the sorts of materials that reveal the process behind the finished product. There are no materials, nope, sorry, that is not what I wrote. These are the materials, these are the materials that bring a creator's career into focus and provide context. And speaking of those creators, I'm about to introduce Chris Claremont, the cornerstone and primum mobile for our archives, <laughs> who started it all in, 2011, in 2010. Because I wanted everyone in the show to have a chance to talk, we're gonna do this thing called a, we're gonna do a modified version of this thing that my boss told me about called a Pecha Kucha. Has anybody heard of that? Pecha Kucha. But instead of 20 slides in 20 seconds, which just is insane, uh, we're gonna have uh, two slides in five minutes. So everyone has a chance to say a little something <laughs> I'm just waving at people, I'm so happy. <laughs> Everyone has a chance to say a little something and the audience will know some of the faces that might be less familiar. So be sure to go up to them at the reception and give them some love. But now, I would introduce to you writer Chris Claremont. Mind you, a five-minute limit for somebody who's used to being paid by the word. <laughs> That's not go fast. Two things. Uh, firstly, I owe a thank you to Al Jaffe. Many years ago, and some of you may know this story, but if you don't, here it is. Uh, I went to an offshoot of Columbia University called Bard College. We were the ones who were too hippie to be allowed on the west side. They kicked us out. And we had a field period where they shut the school for two months and sent us all out into the real world. And I thought, wow, I could work for Mad Magazine. Two months there should really help. <laughs> and Al said, no, to my parents, no way, no how, not going to happen, you have no idea, no, you just never talk to me again. <laughs> Does he like Marvel comics? And I said, sure, why not? So he called Stan Lee, Stan Lee called me, and I said I'd work for nothing, so I was hired. <laughs> <laughs> so, figure the last 48 years are Al's fault. <laughs> um, and... The great satisfaction on my part was that he was the second uh, eminence, well, the first eminence, the second person to be invited into the archives. And it's third. my, the third? Oops. <laughs> Not only that, I can't count. <laughs> but it, it, my privilege is to be exhibited in the same library that has Al stuff. So you should look at his. They're a lot more fun than mine. And uh, a lot more, well, just a lot more fun. <laughs> anyway, I could say a lot more, but I'm out of time, I'm sure. No, I don't think you are. <laughs> Not even okay, close. well, on that note. <laughs> um, the interesting thing about comics is that we spent a lot of time putting them down well, deservedly so in some cases. <laughs> um, but the funny thing was, I was, years ago, I was wandering through the British Museum with my wife, and we found a, an old Psalter from uh, an illuminated manuscript from the 11th century. And, I'm, and on one page, it's all brilliantly gold, silver, the, the works. 
The other page were pencils. And I look at this for about five minutes, and I turn to Beth, and I say, I'd hire this guy. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, there you go. This is not a new phenomenon. It's not a new way of expressing ourselves. It is a way that reaches back as far and as deeply into the history of art in culture, Western culture certainly, as any more respectable aspect of uh, literature and, and as such it's worth a, a deeper look and I'm so incredibly grateful to Columbia for giving us that opportunity. You're up, Al. <laughs> Legend Al Daffy. to thank Chris for being so gracious, uh, but above all, I have to thank Karen for inviting me into this program. Uh, I, uh, cartooning has been very, very good to me in so many different ways. When I was a young child, I was, I was whisked off to a what is known as a shtetl in Lithuania, where uh, I was six years old. And I arrived there, I didn't know, I, and I, I came from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, Savannah, Georgia to a shtetl in Lithuania is like going to the moon. And uh, uh, I was, I did not know the language and uh, everything was very difficult until I tried something with the local kids who were uh, kind of making fun of me because of my strange clothes and my speech. And uh, I started drawing in the, in the sand. Uh, I started drawing cartoon characters that I remember f from America. And they, they were just fascinated by it. And uh, of course, as time went on, they kept asking me to do more and more of that stuff. So that I found out that this was a great way to survive in an alien world uh, and also to create in an alien world. Uh, when I returned to America, just as Hitler had become the chancellor of Germany and staying in Europe was not the greatest idea in the world. Uh, I, I, I came not back to Savannah, but to New York to live. And because New York City was so good to me and educated me and gave me an opportunity to go to an art school uh, free uh, and, uh, and, all the, and all that followed, uh, I am honored to be able to give my archives to Columbia University and to Karen's program. Thank you, sir. of Wendy and Richard Peeney.
I thought you'd be bigger in person. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, get used to it. You're going to get a lot of love and a lot of thanks tonight. We have to start off again by thanking Karis, uh, Karen for uh, asking us to uh, donate the Elfcrest archives to Columbia because it addressed a question we had had for many, many years that caused recurring nightmares, which was, since I'm a pack rat, <laughs> what would happen to all of the artwork, all of the papers, all of the scripts, all of everything that I had been saving ever since she started doing ElfQuest. The nightmare was five minutes after we're dead, there's a flood on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> and that was horrifying to us because we weren't going to get any of it. <laughs> so thank you for that approach at oh. Comic-Con in 2012. My we are so honored you. and so grateful to be a part of this collection. It's very mutual. <laughs> well, uh, ElfQuest is uh, uh, just the biggest accident that could ever happen to anybody. I, I, I never intended to be a comic artist. I was either going to be a belly dancer or um, a, a, a writer of some kind or maybe an animator. So uh, this incredible accident that happened. And I must give a shout out and thanks to Roy Thomas and Frank Thorne because it was the two of them that opened the door for me with my first uh, professional writing job at Marvel Comics. And um, there's just so much history behind that with Red Sonja, and you'll see, you'll see all of that in the exhibit. Uh, but, but ElfQuest is what happens when two completely lawless people who probably should have been supervised but never were <laughs> get to do exactly what they want to do without anybody telling them they can't and and to express exactly what they want to express all kind of under the radar of of more traditional comics and uh, if anyone had told me that 36 years later i would be drawing more regularly than ever these characters and and the world of elfquest I would have told my younger self to design them all bald, nude, and identical. <laughs> what you will not ever find, well, I shouldn't say never, but what you won't find in tonight's exhibition is some of the things that Wendy says that I hear when she's drawing these characters that she did not design all bald, nude, and what was the other one? Because identical. Identical. Uh, the hair and the costumes and the attention to detail that she gives not only to the artwork but to the storytelling that I am privileged to work with uh, is just incredible. Um, as some of you may know, we are on the next big chapter of ElfQuest called Final Quest, and we are nurturing seeds that we planted 35 years ago. And that's so incredibly satisfying that when we reach the end of this story, we're going to see what fruit those seeds will bear. And then everything that we have done vis-a-vis -vis ElfQuest is going to be right here for yes. the future. <laughs> I mean, the reason I'm a pack rat, I'm, I'm convinced, is that her work is just that good that I wanted people 50, 100, 200 years from now to be able to study it. And Mr. Jaffe, the fold-outs of Mad Magazine were why I bought Mad Magazine when I was a child. Cartoonist and illustrator Andrea Tsurumi. Hi. Um, so I'm a cartoonist and I make picture books and illustrations and they're all about a lot of different things. This one is about sports. <laughs> Obviously. Um, so what, what's common to all of them is the idea of looking at normal life and finding what makes it weird and hilarious. And life is weird and hilarious and that 
sending that up, that part of life up, is this long human tradition of uh, a proud uh, history of wise asses going back to <laughs> monks drawing homicidal rabbits in the margins of, of uh, manuscripts to those rude students in 1766, uh, to these amazing cartoonists that I've grown up looking up to my entire life. Uh, so it's, it's an incredible honor to be included in a collection with people whose work I have loved and admired for so long. Um, and it's an especial honor to be in, not only in a library, but in this library. Um, li when I was growing up, comics weren't, they were starting to get into mainstream bookstores, so libraries were the first places that I found them, and they introduced me to Charles Adams and to Jules Pfeiffer and to all kinds of people, and they just kind of fed me, and I just ate them. And Butler Library was the first like mega research library I'd ever been introduced to, because 16 years ago, my mom used to bring me here when she was researching her doctorate, and I would research my school papers at the same time. <laughs> um, so it's just insane that my uh, odd interpretation of bra shopping is going to be a resource for <laughs> future, future students. But from someone who knows what a treasure it is to have a library, um, what bounty it is to have that stuff accessible, to you. I am so happy that this place exists and that it is growing and that it is going it is making and is going to make students just so incredibly happy. So thank you, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> next poet, Alexander Rothman. Hi everyone, my name is Alexander Rothman. Uh, what an honor it is to be part of this exhibition and uh, it is humbling and or uh, intimidating to be talking to, uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> humbling and or intimidating to be talking to everyone assembled here. So I make comics poetry. My work uh, hybridizes those two forms. And I just wanna talk uh, very briefly about what that means because uh, basically, nobody knows what that means, and uh, about the, the journal that I edit with some people called Ink Brick. So uh, I'm certainly not going to try to define comics to this crowd, but I want to focus on the way in which comics are visual language, right? We uh, know that people tend to use comics for storytelling, and they tend to use images, I think, distinct from other forms of illustration in that they're not just highlighting or enhancing a narrative, but they're creating the narrative. Um, so I would say comics are visual language. And poetry, what's that? I mean, that's a ridiculous question as well because so many wildly different things have been called poetry and are. Um, but I would say that poetry is an art form where the medium is language, right? It's language as language. And it's distinct from other things uh, like prose in that you can, I think, have a successful novel where... Oh, Ooh, what just happened? Oh, somebody hit the, the switch. <laughs> you can have a successful novel where the writing isn't very good. It can be rescued <laughs> by <laughs> plot or characterization or things like that. And anybody who's ever used a university library knows that you can have a brilliant academic treatise or book that is just monstrously poorly written. I would argue that you can't have a poem that succeeds where the writing doesn't succeed. Uh, I think poetry can use characterization, plot, uh, logical progression of ideas, all those things, but it doesn't have to. And it can dig even deeper into the kind of toolbox of language to use the sounds of words uh, individually uh, through assonance or alliteration, things like that, blank space on the page, the sounds of words in sequence through rhythm, all of these wonderful extra dimensions of language that it can draw upon for its art. So you have comics as visual language, and you have poetry as a form that just wrings every drop of artistic potential out of language. So uh, the work that I try to do and that the journal Ink Brick that I edit uh, is trying to do, asks the question, what happens when you turn that visual language toward poetry? toward the extra dimensions. 
All right, I'm about to run out of time. Um, I will say one last thing, which is that early on in this process, Karen told me about a really wonderful resource here in the Rare Book Collection uh, that was C Comics. There's a, a visual artist named Joe Brainerd who worked with a bunch of New York School poets in the 60s to produce these mimeographed anthologies. They're wonderful. You should check them out. <laughs> Triple threat, Peter Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> we just swallow this and talk into it. Oh, that would be nice. We could get um, your, your So family. for starters, I'm just, I'm just doing what everybody in here wants to do. So, <laughs> um, you, know, you cannot say enough about Karen and uh, what she's done to bring, help elevate comics into the position that they're, they've always been deserve in, but to be. deserve to be, and you know, that we're happy to see land here. Um, uh, in 1970, when I did my first fanzine, um, which my friend and I called fanzine, <laughs> it had a PH, so it was very different than fanzine. Um, we had, our editorial was about how important comics were and that if you wrote to us, we'd send you um, a little uh, newsletter that you could go around your neighborhood and hand out door to door, telling people how important comics were. <laughs> Weirdly, nobody wrote in asking for this. <laughs> um, at that time, and, and for many years uh, to follow, uh, going to a comic convention meant going to a room filled with guys. And there were no women to be seen. And now you have women creating incredible comics and curating collections of comics, and that's one of the huge steps that, that has happened with the form that is so quite amazing. And uh, when I went to art school at Pratt Institute, uh, there was no comics curriculum, there was no comics course. Uh, comics were generally discouraged. The teachers suggested that I move on to something more artistic. And, uh, um, and uh, Dan Klaus, who was there at the same time, was also moving on to something, you know, more fine artedly apparently, and uh, uh, it, it has just been amazing to watch as the form has slowly, essentially, taken over the world. I mean, everywhere you turn now, there's something that uh, Chris is responsible for, or any number of the people in here, and I expect we're going to see a lot more of that as time goes by. But the idea that they're being regarded um, as high art in this way, being given the, this position where people can enjoy them without um, embarrassment, for example, maybe even read them on the subway. Um, and, um, and that, uh, you know, the, the, this transformation that, that has been going on, but it's, it's really still in its infancy. And so it's sort of a remarkable time period. I've always enjoyed that aspect of the form of being as if, you know, you're in on a secret that you know, it was, it was actually a little upsetting when Star Wars came out because that was sort of like the doors flew open and then suddenly there were all these other people at comic conventions. And you weren't invited. Wait a minute, that's ours. But, but in reality, of course, we want to share this. This is what it's all about. And the, uh, and the pleasure of being able to share it and participate in it and be in the room with my heroes like Al Jaffe, for example, and many other people here. And um, to you know, enjoy this form like this, and uh, and even in the strangest twist of events, I'm now teaching comics at Harvard. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, um, so on to more stuff. interesting stuff. Yes. Thank you. Peter. Our team is an illustrator, Gregory Benton. So my name is Gregory Benton. I, I probably am not known to many of you, and that's that's fine. Um, it's not. I say hello, and I say first off again, not you know, thank you so much, Karen, for everything, for for all of us. Um, I'm honored and I am humbled to be part of this. Thank you so much for for inviting me. Um, and I got to see the exhibit. We're all in for an amazing treat. It's a, outstanding. It's it's stunning. Um, so I guess I'm up here because. Um, in 2013, I did a book called 
BNF, which was a short comic book, but very large format. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was one of the, one of the um, comics that was selected by the Society of Illustrators. Um, the Mocha Fest um, got a, an award of excellence. And, and that is why it is here now, because they donated that, that first selection of, of people's work. Every year. To this, for every, and for every year. Um, so uh, it's about a, a, a giant dog and, a, and, a, and, a, and a either a normal-sized woman or a small woman <laughs> and a normal-sized dog. <laughs> <laughs> And that guy, I guess that guy's, it's a matter of perspective, I guess. <laughs> um, um, but um, I first fell in love with comics in kindergarten. And, uh, you know, I was a bit rambunctious. And the teacher said you wouldn't amount to anything. Aww. And comics, they loved me. They said, come over here. And they loved me. So that's it. But I just want to say thank you again to Karen. And I want to give a shout out to Peter Cooper, who was a, a very big nurturer in my early young fledgling career. Yeah, gave World me War III. A, yeah, gave me my first break in World War III and taught me how to be a very good professional. Even though I didn't always follow your advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it's great to see everybody here. This is, it, it, it's amazing. And Al Jaffe, just as a, like everyone else, you were a great influence on me, even though we never really had the chance to talk about it. Maybe that'll be rectified later. Um, thank you, enjoy it. Cartooning folklorist Sophia Wiedemann. <laughs> Yeah, Wiedemann, um, I uh, draw comics. Uh, I draw comics that are incredibly difficult to define. People are always like, oh, that's so cool you draw comics. What, what, are, what, what kind? And I'm always like, um. Uh, so it's incredibly validating that, um, that uh, Karen thought that my comics belonged in uh, something like this. Um, especially, you know, for someone who doesn't know how to describe her own work, I have a feeling that a lot of the works uh, that we're going to see tonight fall into that category of um, hard to define comics. Um, it's so exciting that there's somebody like you in, in this world, seriously, um, who has all of the authority <laughs> of academia behind her and the enthusiasm and warmth and support of a true fan. It's so important. It's um, it's important to me as um, uh, as a woman who draws uh, comics for women and and boys <laughs> um, <laughs> that there is a female authority um, who I don't know who just brings uh, a lot of weight. Um, so what we're doing. <laughs> Um, because this is important, and um, and I'm incredibly honored to be part of it. So thank you so much. Thank you. So much. We have a, a, the director of our Leroy Neiman Center for Printmaking, Tomas Vu Daniel, who I saw somewhere in here, uh, has taught a couple of years of making comics. And so we have two alumna from two alumnae, two alumni, <coughs> depending on whether you're English or American, um, here, one of whom is Forsyth Harmon. Thank you so much, Karen, for having me. I'm so honored to be among such accomplished company. Um, in the exhibition title, Past, Present, Future, I'm a part of the future. I'm just getting started here, but very honored to be so. I thought I would just talk a little bit about the piece that I have upstairs in the incredible show. It's called Broken Up. It's a heteronormative, female, romantic, disillusionment narrative under late capitalism. <laughs> by the first two pages. <laughs> we broke up. <laughs> I bought shit. <laughs> and I hid my crying eyes behind sunglasses by Ilisteva and Terry Lassery. Uh, I drank from vintage crystal decanters. And uh, 
I fucked everyone in Agent Provocateur lingerie. <laughs> um, it was incredible to be able to work with Tomas Vu at the Leroy Neiman Prince Center, just down in Dodge Hall here. Um, there was, uh, there's been a class um, for a few years in a row conducted in, in creating graphic novels, uh, and Karen was also a big part of that, so I'm really grateful to the university. Um, yeah, a little bit about the construction. Um, I did it in multiples in order to mirror the perceived rarity and simultaneous multiplicity of luxury objects, uh, as well as the perceived personal nature, but sort of general progression through the stages of grief. Um, I created a case here that evokes a jewel box, and it's got a velvet interior, something like an engagement ring might be given in. <laughs> and last but not least, what is a luxury object without a brand name? So we branded the box, broken up by Calvin Klein, no Forsyth Harmon. Um, so really, um, I'm just so excited to be getting started and for my beginnings to be validated by someone so knowledgeable as Karen and by everyone in this room, it really gives me a lot of encouragement, which you need when you're starting out so much. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really grateful for that. And uh, I really hope you guys make some visits to the Rare Book and Manuscript Library upstairs um, and take a look at all of the bling. It's incredible. <laughs> uh, wonderful resource. So thank you again. Cartoonist and amazing educator Tom Motley. Thank you, sir. Such an honor. Thank you so much. Um, I brought a couple of visual aids. I'll try to come up under this. Uh, this is the center spread to a piece that's in the show. That's uh, you'll probably just see the outside. It's a uh, foldy silkscreen comic. Um, folds out. Folds out to look like that. Um, nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, really. Um, I wanted to seize the occasion to mention my collaborator on this. It started, this, uh, you, you'll see it up there, uh, started as a uh, jam comic through the mail for, with uh, a cartoonist named Buzz Buzzizik, who uh, also goes by, he's better known by the name Maximum Traffic. And so here's a, one of his uh, Xerox things. Uh, Max is from the first generation of mini comic artists, going back to the 1980s, and uh, has published, uh, over the years, until very recently, has published this uh, White Buffalo Gazette, which is an a anthology known mostly to the people who are in it, and uh, it's cartoonists who, <laughs> cartoonists who uh, are really only known by each other, except for, you know, the, uh, John Porcelino is a famous uh, member of this group, but others like uh, Brad Foster and Matt Fizell, and many of these cartoonists. Uh, there was uh, recently, uh, a Fanographics collection of mini, the underground mini comics from the 1980s, and uh, in a review by Tom Spurgeon, Spurgeon uh, commented on how we were all cartooning into the void. <laughs> and that's, that's really what it felt like. Is uh, for for so many years, all these cartoonists just mailing stuff to each other, uh, jamming back and forth like a, like this thing I did with Max, and. Um, so it's so nice to see some of it in, a, in an August institution like this. Uh, ah, here comes my other slide. Okay, so the other, the other, one of the other pieces I have is a collection of strips I and some friends have done making fun of the old insult that made a man out of Mac comic from the uh, Charles Atlas ads. And uh, this one is not in there because it wasn't drawn yet at the time that this booklet came out, but it'll be in a future edition. And it's a piece I did uh, in honor of Al Jaffe, so a little uh, sketch of Jaffe in the upper corner. Uh, Karen's going to hold the mic for me. So I'll, I'll have this if anybody wants to come look at it. It's a piece where you, uh, you take the original uh, Atlas strip and unfold it, and there's a new comic in there. It's a, in a, a respect for the master. <laughs> So that's all. Uh, come, I've got work to work with me if people want to talk to me up there. But I'm eager to go see the show. So uh, let's move on. <laughs> Another Columbia alumna, Ryaki and Yama. Hi. 
Um, thank you. Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Uliaki. I'm from Japan. Um, I hope everyone loves Japanese comics and anime. <laughs> um, so I graduated. Uh, I graduated from MFA program at Columbia in 2013, and I took graphic novel class in 2012. And my graphic novel in the show. Um, thank you so much for including me, Karen. Um, I'm so, so happy beautiful. about it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I made a, a traditional style graphic novel called Emaki, Japanese traditional style uh, graphic novel called Emaki. So this is the um, Emaki. Um, so Emaki is a horizontal hand scroll and it combines both text and the pictures often depicting folk tales, romance, words, and stories, stories of supernatural world. To read the Emaki, you need to scroll it yourself uh, by hand, so I will show you. Um, so like this, um, the scroll um, by hand. Okay. So. <laughs> um, right. So um, Emaki is the origin of animation rather than comics. The oldest extant Emaki in Japan is from the seventh century. And it's an illustrated scroll, book, a scroll of Buddha's life. Emaki is deeply tied with, uh, with the world view of Buddhism. There are many emaki, and not focused on Buddhism necessarily, but there are common features of story of all of them drawn on emaki. The biggest feature of emaki is that the space-time of the story is non-linear. Um, it's probably a major reason why it takes the scroll format um, first, present, and the future can be synchronized in the story, and the readers will journey through multiple time and space through the protagonist. Emaki is like a guide map, to, uh, guide map on how to enter to another world from reality, indicating the gate to collective subconscious, or how to come back safely to reality from another space time. Through the trip in Emaki, readers acquire a view of non-linear ontology that interpret themselves uh, who are living in the present world in relationship with the great history of human beings and the magnificent universe. They can understand themselves as a metaphor of something in great history. Um, in relation to uh, ontology, uh, there is a unique genre in Japanese, li Japanese literature um, it is diary literature that is most essential in the traditional genre. Um, Japanese diaries are records of what they feel in their minds on the day, know what happened um, on the day in reality. So it allowed us to live life as a fictional narrative story like a comic. I think this flexible anthology is one of the big reasons why people are attracted to Japanese anime, manga, and cosplay. Um, my emaki is my picture diary. Um, the story starts with a four years old me traveling Wonderland forest. She went to an art supply store um, <laughs> in the forest that is managed by a big, white, fluffy speaking dog. So for me, this is the story. Um, it's my first year in my fair life at Columbia. Um, <laughs> In my mind, I was returning to a four years old girl and living on this campus as another world. Um, to me, who came from a totally different world, Japanese underground art um, world, my new campus life was full of wonder, full of mystery, and full of nonsense. It was very scary, uh, very confusing, but so inspiring and amazingly um, interesting. Then, at the middle of the story, she crosses a bridge and went to the next wonderland. Um, she arrives at a geisha house in the Edo era. Once she went through the gate of the geisha house, she transformed to a 19 years old male artist. Um, he's me in the second year of my MFA, who struggled to figure out the concept for final works for graduation show. Um, <laughs> So in the story, he couldn't find what he wanted to draw for the slide door in the geisha house. Um, while he was struggling until midnight, 
beautiful ghosts of geisha appeared and started teasing him. But those ghosts were actually his femininity, uh, mirroring his own image. And that was uh, what he had to understand most in order to go back to reality as an artist. Mm. Like that, living life as a story with multiple persona and time space in historical metaphor is the reality of my life. It is a non-fiction, but it also it's a fiction. Living with a flexible persona beyond the biological age, gender, nationality, race, time, or even species is truly living for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it has made my life art as a protagonist in comics. So I have kept my diary since I came here uh, five years ago um, to publish them in the future. Karen, I hope um, this library will have uh, copies of my diary someday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mac McGill, we're just going to let his images speak for themselves. You're going to see more of uh, his work upstairs. Absolutely. So beautiful. So incredibly beautiful. And so finally, our final speaker, the aspirational figure for fanboys everywhere, Mr. Paul Levitz. <laughs> Aspirational figure for fanboys. <laughs> it's really a frightening concept. <laughs> um, I first set foot on this campus when I was 13 to learn to program computers in the basement of Pupin, back when the PhD computer stu students could figure out how to do Snoopy sitting on his do doghouse made out of X's. And that was computer art. At about the same time I was writing for my junior high school yearbook an article about could we just get comics enthusiasts to be called panelologists because then somebody might take us seriously. <laughs> it has been a very long quest for the fanboys to get a measure of respect. And we are, speaking for the collective universe of them, deeply grateful to have Columbia respect us, treat us this way, treat our materials this way, and to Karen for her Dona Quixote <laughs> efforts <laughs> to declare herself graphic novel librarian and take over Butler. You, you have arranged for our whole floor, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a few things coming in any, any minute now. Um, I think every, everyone here has expressed their pleasure at that. This is such a wonderful medium. You look at the diversity of what's going on. It is growing and exploding at a pace unlike anything that has happened in my lifetime in comics in America. And we probably can fill Butler when we're done. And I look forward to that time. Thank you again, Karen, for everything. So there are a couple of people missing tonight, sadly. Uh, Jens Robinson was hoping to be here, but sadly, as many of you may know, his mother, Gro, passed away last month, um, and that affected his plans. But I did want to say a word about his father, Jerry Robinson. <laughs> yes. Applause for Jerry Robinson. Thank you. We've had a couple of alumni speak already. Jerry wasn't an alumnus, but he was an attendee. Uh, he did attend Columbia for a while, a fact of which he was very proud. You'll see some evidence of that upstairs, as well as some of his Broadway work for Playbill, evidence of the versatility of this artist, historian, activist, and golden age legend. Also absent tonight is Dennis Kitchen. Who who wisely felt that becoming a grandfather was more important than being here. <laughs> the riches of the Kitchen Sink Press archives are virtually indescribable. 
and have already inspired two different book proposals that I'm aware of. Uh, you'll see some treats from that collection tonight, including correspondence from everyone pictured here. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, a word about an, a name unfamiliar to you all, Amram, to, unfamiliar to you now, but not unfamiliar to you soon, Amram Scheinfeld, who published popular books on heredity in the 1940s and 50s, and taught at Columbia's Teachers College, which is why we have his archives, but who worked as a professional cartoonist in the 1920s and 30s. You're gonna see a lot of his work tonight. This is partly because he left such a large and diverse archive of his comics material that he has something to offer for every aspect that I wanted to address in this exhibition. His archives are an incredible inspiration for the sort of collections that we're looking for that we're hoping to acquire from many of you here tonight. <laughs> if you'd like more information on what we're looking for, there's a little brochure that says Comics at Columbia on the back table there, uh, next to a mailing list sign-up sheet if you'd like to be on the mailing list for events on comics. So, gosh, look at it, it's seven. How awesome are we that we did this so fast? So sign up for our mailing list on the forms on the back counter. Sign the guest book upstairs at the exhibition. Make sure you see all five of the little cube vitrines that are in addition to the cases on the wall. Have some food, have some drink, which is deeper into RBML to make you go in. Um, and let me know what you all think. Now let's go celebrate comics and have a good time.